Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode 35, Haskell. Take it away, Patrick. Welcome to another episode of Programming Throwdown. Here late at night Yay. on the shores of Lake Michigan. <laughs> you know, if we average one episode a month, we're close to the three-year mark. We used to do more than uh, one episode a month, but now we've been pretty regular at once a month. Yeah, but then we had that break, too. Oh, that's so true. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the average I think we did 14 is. each in our first couple mo- couple years or something. So I think we're actually on like the fourth calendar year that we've been doing this or something. Man, that's a, actually a, a coworker of mine uh, watched the or listened to the first episode and uh, he, was, he was telling me, oh, I started using your tool of the show. And I had no idea <laughs> what he was talking about because it's been so long. Dude, that was four years ago. <laughs> I know. Yes. Uh, we, we didn't even live in the same states that we do now so that's true it was a long time ago that's true all right well first i want to start off with a shout out to the player fm team they sent us a nice email talking to us or showing us actually a picture of google io and they were uh, demoing an application they made uh you can check it out that that uh allows you to listen to podcasts and they featured programming related podcast and specifically programming throwdown um at google io so if you're at io and you saw our picture why did you not also send us that picture? That would have been cool. But uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, you know, some some of you may be listening for the first time from that. Although that was a little while ago, so you probably already listened. But thank you to the Player FM team for that honor. Yeah, definitely, we appreciate it. That was that was totally unexpected, and uh, it was a it was a really a privilege to uh, to be at Google I/O. Do you care what your job title is? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is one of these uh, tough questions. So I actually got asked this a few times. Once on Quora, somebody asked me to answer it. And then coincidentally, twice in real life, two different people asked me. Uh, and basically the gist of it is, you know, it's, it always it comes along the same lines. Like, you know, uh, I'm applying, you know, one company gave me job title X, the other company gave me job title Y. And it's not like one is... Uh, well, it's, it, and so the idea there is, it's not like one is like chemist and the other is computer programmer, right? I mean, they're all kind of programming related. It might just be one is like a senior and the other isn't, or or you're like senior staff engineer at a company of four people, but you're just regular engineer at like a huge company, you know, and, and uh, or you're data scientist for software engineer. And uh, <clears throat> the reason why... Uh, uh, the reason I've heard of reasons why it actually does matter is for Visa. It's kind of unexpected, but uh, I have a colleague who's uh, going for his, I guess they call it the E1A visa, which uh, there's many different visas that you can get to uh, work in the U.S. And the E1A is E stands for exceptional. And it's for people who have just a lot of publications or Nobel Prize, you know, people who contributed to Nobel Prize, you know, projects or things like that. And so this person felt like, you know, getting the scientist title would sort of help his visa situation. But, you know, outside of that, I mean, that could be true. I'm personally of the mindset that it doesn't really matter. But uh, what's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, if you have, ex- uh, well, extenuating circumstances maybe sounds bad. But, uh, yeah, if, unless the visa thing, I don't know anything about that. But as a general rule for me personally, no, I don't think it matters. Um, the problem is every company defines them differently and different companies have different expectations. So if you're CTO of a, your own startup or you know CEO and CTO of your own startup, that means something different than if you're CTO of Facebook. Um, right. So like right. they're not even in the same class. And those are obviously an extreme example. But being a senior engineer at one place or not senior engineer at another, you know, it just depends. If it's a newer company versus a more legacy company, um, depending on what field it's in and, you know, what kind of mapping they do or want to be able to say we have, they may push people to be senior because they want to be able to say we have this many senior software engineers working on something, right? And they can skew and play games with it. Um, and ultimately, that's something that's actually really hard to find out before you accept a job at a company. It's not something that, 
you're going to be able to ask a question like, what is the number of years of industry experience a person with this title typically has in your company? Right. They're going to be like, uh, right. either that's not like that's personal or like or protected to the company or they don't know. And so it's really hard. Once you're in a company, you have a feel. But before you join a company, I don't know. I think you. I don't know that it has any correlation to your responsibility or your pay. So the things that really show a company how much a company cares about you is how much they offer you um, and like the perks and the kinds of things. And then what kind of role they describe having a vision for you. And depending on the company, that role may or may not be something you actually end up doing. But um, I think that's well, how a to, company... So to play devil's it. advocate though, right? Like if you, if you have a higher title than... Like, you know, if, if you're, let's say you're applying, let's say you want to change jobs, right? So the recruiter, you know, on day one, they don't have as much to go off of. If you're like, you know, really like senior staff software engineer versus if you're like level one software engineer, the recruiter is going to kind of put you on a different path, right? Uh, I, I don't, I, I mean, but I, I guess would, it depends on sure, the company. Maybe a bad recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. No, I mean, you should indicate yeah, it because some places really just have software engineer, right? Like, that's just it. Or especially if you work at a place that isn't a software engineering firm, right? Like, they mostly do something else. Um, you may just be software engineer and you need, it's up to you to describe your role, right? Like, I manage a team or I'm an individual contributor or, and people always kind of lie on their resume a little, but I think part of the interview process should hopefully be them trying to figure out, like, what level of responsibility you have at your current company. Yeah, that makes sense. But, that makes sense. Yeah, I also agree that it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I mean, it sounds like this visa thing has some carry some weight because you know you, your your visa packet goes to somebody who probably knows nothing about the industry. Yeah, you know whatever industry you're in. Um, I would say so. It, so that makes yeah, sense. But yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter. But it does matter. <laughs> it does sound nice. Oh, so why a, do you think no, it does matter? No, when you matter. have a good title, it sounds nice, right? Like it, it's like oh, oh like okay. and I get called a better title, right? Like. That's nice. Maybe it has that psychological, like, you know, because you have a better title, you go in with, like, more bravado. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That could happen. It's, yeah. I think it's just too complicated. It could go either way. So the variance of what it means is too high. Whether it means a little or yeah. a lot depends on so many things that, like, you just can't weigh it properly. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I mean, I would think that some of the, like, larger companies probably have some kind of matrix where it's like okay if this person comes from intel and they have title x then we'll like s you know start off assuming that there'll be title y at microsoft or whatever you yeah. know like there's probably that at the very like large scale so if you're going from one huge company to another but like uh yeah in general but why does it but um, why do they care about and this goes back and, and this isn't you know i don't think you should take a job just based on salary but the reason they that i've ever heard of uh, recruiting or managers hiring people ever care about what level to place them is always because they're trying to get to a target salary and typically the salary you're able to put someone at is based on the position at your company so like by moving them up one title you can give them more salary and so the only reason they've ever wanted to move people up is because they want to make them a more competitive offer, not because they thought they were a more skilled worker. Um, but that's dependent oh, on gotcha. the company. So that's why I said like the actual revealing bit of information is your salary offer, not the title. But then on the flip side, right, if you don't reveal your salary when you're negotiating your future job, then they still have your title unless you don't reveal that oh, either. That's true. Yeah. So I guess like they could try to infer your current salary from your title. But then maybe that just means you should never reveal either. <laughs> yeah, you probably shouldn't reveal either. Yeah. I think we talked about this in mm -hmm. the... Actually, you know, we had an interviewing show, but we never had a salary negotiation show. Uh, that's a, that, that sounds like a be, stressful show. Yeah, that, that would be that would, uh, that would stress me out. I don't want to give people advice there. <laughs> so I, I watched, uh, I managed to watch the final game. I tuned in just at the right time to watch the conclusion of The International, which sounds like a movie, but is actually the yeah. Dota defense, defense of the Asians, Ancients, Defense of the Ancients. I think that's what it stands for. Yeah, by Valve, right. a, game, a video game. We're talking about video games by Valve. 
uh, and the world champions or whatever is called the international. And it made a bunch of press this year because um, the prize pool was $10 million. And I think the winning team got just over $5 million and there's five people on a team. So they became instant millionaires each, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah. one interesting thing is that uh, Valve didn't put in the prize pool themselves. People bought items in game in order to uh, increase the prize pool for the other competitors. Yeah, this is totally genius. So Valve came out with Dota Defense of the Ancients 2, or Dota 2, and they had a, you know, they didn't want to unbalance the game. Like, there's a game that came out called Battlefield Heroes, uh, where you could, uh, it was free to play, but you could buy, like, a better gun or whatever, right? And and it wasn't very popular. It was reasonably popular, but it wasn't that popular. And and the big thing is, you know, the more competitive you are, and, and most people who play Dota 2 are just have a competitive nature, uh, the more, like, you don't want things that... You don't want you money don't to, to influence the game. Pay to win. Yeah, pay to exactly. win, call it, yeah. Pay to win, that's right. But, uh, uh, so what these guys did is they took a page out of the Korean MMO handbook and said, okay, we're just going to sell, like, funny hats and sweatshirts and weapons that don't actually do damage, like, any more than normal. There's different looks. And so yeah. just... Yeah, we'll sell looks. And I remember kind of thinking, this is ridiculous. And I remember thinking, like, okay, one of these days I'll spend, you know, some money and buy a hat just because I like the game. But uh, it ended up not happening. But then what they did was they added this um, this donation thing. So now it's like, not only is there a donation aspect of it, where, you know, that your money will go, part of it will go to these, uh, you know, top-notch players. But then also they added like an achievement kind of system. The point is like they 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 finally hit the formula on how to get money from people without affecting the gameplay. Yeah. And, and there was something was more complicated impressive. too. Like I think as they cross certain like almost like a Kickstarter campaign as well like as if you bought it and then enough other people bought it, you got more benefit from having bought it or whatever. Yeah, there's a pyramid scheme, basically. Yeah, not exactly, but yeah, something like that was more complicated. Anyways, but whatever, got a lot of press attention for them. I wonder how many new people, like, played the game. I mean, I never, I'd heard of the game, but I've never played it, still haven't played it. But I actually know how it's played now, uh, versus I didn't. <laughs> nice. And they had a bunch of simultaneous streams going, so, like, you know, different languages. But then also, like, if you've never played the game, like, a new, and it's confusing because the team that won is called Newbie. Oh, spoiler alert. Oh, nice. Um, but then they had a newbie <laughs> channel, like a new player channel, which like if you've never played before, instead of just using the weird acronyms and slang, they would try to explain what was going on, um, which of oh. course it was still happening in real time, so they didn't fall behind, which made it hard. Like, okay, hang on, we'll come back to that because right. this is what's happening now. But um, <laughs> yeah. and I thought that was nice. And it was cool to watch a video game where they actually had real announcers. They had like fireworks when the team finally won. Uh, you know, and um, it was really, uh, you know, I I can't say that I'm a big fan of watching video games. I've never really watched them before, like live or anything. But, um, you know, it, it was kind of interesting to watch. You know, I'll try it. I've never watched video games live either, but uh, but uh, I've been hearing a lot about it. Is it still going on? No, so it it's done? done. I think League of Legends is currently in some sort of tournament now, which is the other big MOBA. But, oh, okay. um I, this one is done. The team won uh, a team new, team newbie from China. Um, when I think actually two teams from China <laughs> were in the um, finals. And yeah, so the thing was that you know you watch it, and because this game is actually really quite complicated and hard to explain and very fast, like your actions per minute really matter. Um, it makes it for a little bit of a weird thing. So like this attack happens and just kind of like finishes very quickly. And it's like you kind of don't know what happened. Uh, and they also, it's, you know, a big map and they move around the map very quickly to show you different things happening in different places. So it's, it was a little hard to watch. It wasn't as nice as, say, you know, watching a football game or a basketball game where there's nice breaks in the action where they can show you an instant replay. And that's, Yeah, and there's only one ball. Yeah, and only one really center of action. And yeah, this is just kind of crazy. Wow, yeah, I'll have to check this out. I'm sure I can watch uh, Archive. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, But I was, you know, I was on, I watched some of it on Twitch. uh, Is it Twitch.tv? I don't know. On Twitch. Oh, yeah, Twitch is amazing. Yeah, so it was actually really cool. And it was crazy to see the number of people watching. Like, when I tuned in, you know, towards the end, there was, on just the stream I was on, which was like the mainstream, whatever, I think, I want to say there was up up to almost like 300,000 people watching it simultaneously like when I was watching. Oh my god. Um, and that was just one channel that was live. It was like middle of the day, West Coast time. I don't know what time it was other parts of the world. Um, but yeah, that was like one yeah, game, one channel, one time. Fine. Like that's actually, you know, it's not 
a football game can probably generate, you know, millions and millions of views, even for a non-championship game. But still, like, 300,000 is a lot of people to just watch a video game, right? Like, uh, Yeah, I would argue most football games that aren't playoff games won't have that kind of attendance. I think. Well, I mean, that's uh, hard to say because some football amazing. stadiums are like, oh, like 100,000, almost 100,000 people in them just live. Yeah, but that's a third of... Yeah, I guess that's true. But the... Uh, um, the other thing uh, that I was going to say is Twitch TV is, is actually amazing. Like right now they're focused on games, but I don't really see why Twitch TV can't just do anything. Like anytime someone wants to stream anything, you know, like Twitch TV could, could do that. I mean, like I, I think it's just a matter of time before they branch out to just doing streaming video for everyone. It, I, yeah, it seems really popular with the uh, certain groups of people. But yeah, check it out. Yeah, I guess it's true. It's like they have a good niche. Uh, but it just seems like, I mean, everyone should just, uh, I guess there aren't that many things though that you would stream, right? Because like you, you still have to be on your home internet unless they support cell phones. I mean, I think it's a big market already for them. Like between, you know, these, these battle games, like Minecraft has a lot of live streaming. I saw people streaming yeah, even right. like the world of Warcraft card game. Uh, what is it? Hearthstone. Oh, Hearthstone. Yeah, I, I've yeah. been playing that a little on my iPad. I should have made that my tool yeah, of the week. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I, um, I've been playing it on the iPad as well. Yeah, so I really like that game. Um, and there's people who live stream playing that game, I think, I guess from their PC. Um, right. But right. yeah, it's so like people stream what I would consider maybe strange stuff. But uh, Yeah, I mean, I would love to live stream my hikes. Like like just strap a cell phone in my arm or something. Uh, or Google, my you need Google or Glass. Just... Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, maybe Google Glass will... Uh, We'll do, but Google Glass doesn't do streaming, uh, right? I mean, they do Hangouts. Yeah, you can do a Hangouts. But they don't do, but but that's different, right? This is like, like I don't think you could have a thousand people in your Hangouts. Hangouts on air, man. Oh, that's what that people what stream is? to YouTube, but I don't know if you can do that for me. I have no idea. Oh, anyways, it's just software, um, man. Just software. All right, all right. <laughs> it's just software. Ne- ne- next item. Um, yeah, next item. So there's a, uh, so TypeScript, which is actually, uh, we talked about this before the show, we're going to definitely do an episode on all of these JavaScript, um, um, you know, compiled to JavaScript languages like TypeScript and CoffeeScript and things like that. But uh, just a short story on this is, you know, JavaScript is the only, the JavaScript VM is the only VM that's in all popular browsers. And so if you want to write code that works on someone else's computer, on the which it's most likely going to run on their browser, and so it's most likely going to be in JavaScript. Um, with that said, JavaScript isn't really designed for writing like very complex. Um, or, or let me just step back. JavaScript is one language, and as we know from watching this, from listening to this show, uh, you know there's many different languages, and each one kind of serves their purpose. So uh, you'd like to do other languages, but you have JavaScript. So there's a lot of these languages such as TypeScript which compile to JavaScript. So you can write in something else but still run on other people's uh, browsers. And TypeScript is actually made by micro actually it's, it was made by a company that was bought by Microsoft. But um, but uh, they've the compiler has been open sourced but it really hasn't built a lot of community around it. And now there you know there's CoffeeScript and there's other competitors that are pretty good. Um, so they decided to move to GitHub to get sort of that community aspect of GitHub, and they rewrote the compiler, which is pretty cool. I, I, it's got a lot of improvements. But in general, you know, GitHub is another one of those things like Twitch TV that is just really amazed at me at, at uh, how it's just kind of changed the whole ecosystem of programming. It's like the Craigslist of source control. <laughs> like the Craig? Let me think about that. I don't know what that means. So it's not, it sounded really deep. It did sound deep. Yeah, it's the, I can't quite comprehend that. Cause, no, just because everybody <laughs> yeah. says like Craigslist killed the newspaper classifieds, which is where newspapers made a lot of their money. And so like GitHub oh. like kind of killed like a lot of people trying to charge for essentially the same service. But that's yeah, not really a good they, analogy because they it didn't really it, it mostly just made it better as opposed to doing the same thing cheaper. Terrible analogy. I'm sorry. I apologize. The thing GitHub did that 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 I think really is what took them to the top is the way that different users could interact with each other's um, branches, like with each other's repositories. You know, the idea that like somebody could create a branch of my repository and then ask me to merge it back in like that, that was, 
you know, in my opinion, like the big innovation there. Like I, I uh, put Hyperneat, which is my PhD dissertation source code on uh, GitHub. And it has like a ton of forks and somebody went off and made like an arcade or sorry, an, uh, an Atari like uh, emulator AI. And uh, you know, just a ton of crazy things have been forked from it. And I can actually go back and look at what's been forked, uh, even though I don't know any of those people. I think that that is like something pretty amazing that uh, that GitHub that GitHub did. You know, I'm a terrible person. I've been using Git recently. Like I've been trying to learn it more. It's just not clicking with me. I've just not found the right explanation or way to grok it in my head. And I just not that, not about GitHub, so, but Git itself. It's just not yeah. like it does not mesh with my way I've been doing source control. So I, since I didn't start off doing it, I'm trying to figure out like how to adapt. And I think that's the wrong approach. And so I've, I got to work it. But right now, I, you know, I'm not impressed. I don't, I don't care for Git. Yeah, so Git, it, it took me a long time also to learn Git. And I kind of uh, thought that Git was just, it was just kind of ridiculous. And it didn't make sense for a long time. One of the, a couple of things that really helped me early on was Git Stash. I don't know if you've used yes. that. Yes. But... But yeah, like I, I, so I used to think that like you had to just commit all your changes before you could switch branches, and that was kind of frustrating because I'd have two branches that were halfway done and I couldn't figure out how to switch. But git stash lets you do that, and you'd also stash and then update a branch and then unstash, and it so, kind of so I, I should right correct. Thing. Git works fine for me locally, but you know ultimately your, the idea of git is to like share with other people. <laughs> that and that's where it starts yeah. to fall down for me. I start to have problems. Um, oh yeah, well, but so, maybe it's so specifically the, the collaboration tools that that the team I'm on has been using. But yeah, the oh, that's possible. So, anyways, yeah, um, mesh networks are so, pretty cool. And I read an article about I don't know. I, I'm trying to say deep things. I don't know if it's working. <laughs> mesh networks are me- meshy. They're totally They're mesh like a this sieve. This guy's wearing a pink um, shirt. Uh, Oakland. <laughs> this guy's wearing a pink shirt, and his name is Valentine. That should make you look at this. Okay, up. so Oakland is a, a city near where uh, Chase and I live, sort of in the Bay Area of California, near San Francisco, um, and it's known for its. Uh, San Francisco is known to be kind of quirky, and Oakland is even more quirky. I don't know what the right. Is right that word. true? Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. So Oakland. Yeah, so you hear a lot about like protests and stuff from Oakland, and in, in a similar vein, I guess one of the things that Oakland, so they've had some problems with trying to organize um, awareness events, let's call them, and the various authorities deciding to like shut down cell towers or Wi-Fi connectivity, and this has been a continuing problem for them. And also being near such uh, tech-minded people, they've decided that internet is a basic right, and that they would like to have uninterrupted uh, network connection. So they've decided to build a mesh network, both to provide kind of guaranteed access uh, and also to um, get around any potential censorship. So trying to avoid if someone decides to censor something, you know, try to get around it. And so it's basically just about a group of people trying to, I guess, work against the man uh, to uh, build a mesh network. But it's kind of interesting. And they're talking about, I guess, the... Uh, the group of people trying to establish this in Oakland studied one that was uh, uh, used in New York State when a hurricane hit and did pretty good job surviving and actually was used for some of the people uh, right after the hurricane and it was like the only form of connectivity it had even when like cell towers and stuff were down and so that that is a great idea you know people always say that about uh, ham radio operators and how it's really useful to be a ham radio operator right after an emergency and how much help you can be and this is also something that I think would be great um, to get involved with, not even if you don't really agree with the dissident nature of it, perhaps, or like you know using it to coordinate protests, but like the ability that when uh, a, a natural disaster happens, an earthquake, a hurricane, what, what it may be, uh, you know, making sure that people have a, another way of getting on that isn't controlled by kind of just a couple people uh, and maybe you know at risk to single point failures. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember there's a lot of research on like mesh networks and like all sorts of graph theory and what's the like lowest power way to get internet to everybody and all of that. And uh, yeah, but I didn't see too much beyond that. So it's cool that someone's actually building a real one instead of just theorizing. All right. So I, my article's oh. on. Uh, oh, nope. Good. You're good. Uh, <laughs> sorry. My article's on the Raspberry Pi. 
basically there's a new version of the Raspberry Pi, and uh, it's pretty cool. I actually have never owned a Raspberry Pi, but um, I did have a Gumsticks, which is kind of a similar idea, uh, but it was kind of a little bit more niche. I think Raspberry Pi is much more mainstream. I think it was going to be niche, um, but it hit mainstream, or maybe it wasn't. Uh, it was like the first thing to end up becoming mainstream. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was definitely mainstream by accident because they had that, such a huge backlog. Remember? Or maybe maybe people <coughs> did it on purpose, Pi. right? Like people always intend to be mainstream. It just never works out. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so check it out yeah. if you're a Raspberry Pi fan. This one has a bunch it of It fixed a lot of and... nits people were having. I also don't own one, but I, I keep telling myself I'm going to get one and then I'm going to have all these projects to use it for, but I never quite have like, oh, I'm ready to start this project that needs it and order it. And so I've just... I don't want to just buy one and have it sit around. I have too much of that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I hit my critical mass of things that just sit around and collecting dust. So, Including me. Um, yeah, I sit around already, road. collect dust. <laughs> yeah. All um, right, time for b- b- so, Book of the yeah. Show. B- b- book I didn't of the Show. Right. My Book of the Show is Start With Why by Simon Sinek. So I actually uh, was got back into watching TED Talks. Um, which is pretty epic. I just love them. And uh, I, I can't believe it's been so long since I saw them. Actually, TED Talks were kind of on the decline in the sense that, well, they started the TEDx, like the franchise TED Talks. And then they started in the stream, like mingling the TED with the TEDx Talks. And so the quality basically went yeah, down. Yeah, I stopped watching because it was just like most of these are not good. Yeah, I mean, I, I watched like 10 talks in a row from TEDx women. And I mean... You know, women are great. Uh, <laughs> they make up half of the world, and they have a lot of great things to say. But, like, TEDx Women was geared for, like, a specific genre of talk. It was, it was, it was a lot about, like, feminism and, and things like that. And, and it, was just, it was too niche, right? And, to get, and I got ten in a row of those, and I was like, okay, you know, I'm kind of done. And so uh, they started doing that, but now they're back. Um, you know, the, the past like 10 or 11 TED Talks on the, the YouTube stream have all been from the main TED conference right. and uh, they've been amazing. I'll have to check and it out. one of them was from Simon Sinek, who uh, I was so impressed with his talk. I got his book Ooh. and I've uh, been going through it. Wait, like Dead Tree basically, version? Basically, the Dead Tree. No, I got the Kindle oh, okay. version. Yeah, so I'm saving, saving some trees, hurting some bits. <laughs> Those bits are like just burning at the stake. Um, so basically, the book is about uh, um, different companies, and actually, it really kind of uh, covers this idea of company culture and sort of what that means, and and uh, how to sort of have a strong culture, like internally and externally. Um, and it has a bunch of great examples. It goes over a variety of different companies. Um, but but one of the things to really take away is they. S- they say, you know, when you're uh, pitching something, don't start with what. They say, like, companies that start with what end up becoming commodities. So, for example, if you say, we're Intel, we make a processor that's, you know, 1.2 times as fast, you know, it's 20% faster than the other processor. So, if you start with what, you become a commodity. Like, you're only as good as your 20% improvement. And if the other company comes with like a 30% improvement, then people will just go with that, right? But if you start with why, like, uh, uh, you know, let me think of, let me pick on a company here. Um, Tesla. Like uh, Tesla. We believe, and I, I don't know what Tesla believes, I'm just making this up, right? But it's like Tesla, you know, nobody should have to, you know, put fuel in their tank again. Or Tesla, Saving like, Saving the world. Why are we. One tank at a time. Yeah, but, but, but it's not only about... So saving the world is also a what, oh, okay. right? So, so you have to ask, like, why save the world? <laughs> Wait, you have <laughs> like to say why, why save, save like, the world? Yeah, of course. Uh... <laughs> or or maybe more specifically, why, you know, why what Tesla is doing is saving the world more than other things, you know what I mean? I'm going like, to watch this talk. Like, I'm intrigued. Yeah, I'm not doing a good job because I'm not Simon Sinek. And and the reason why I like this book so much is because it, uh, it really, he does an amazing job explaining something that is pretty innate and biological. And he actually goes into biology and chemistry of the brain and things like that. 
and he's done a lot of research and he explains something which is uh you know like y you often like get these kind of feelings like, i remember when i got my first ipod um the way that you could endlessly scroll through your music because it had the wheel right the little touch sensitive wheel and instead of having instead of having a like the the zoom had the thing that you slid with your thumb and you had to like bring your thumb back to the starting position and slide it again but the idea that like you could just slide forever with your thumb there's something kind of innately cool about that it's sort of like when you watch plinko in the price is right like there's some like neurons that fire and you get a kick out of watching the little disc like bounce on those pegs we are right? totally so like so deep in analogy in this in this uh show this is, this is <laughs> yeah awesome. i've gone too far saving the, the world uh, is like a plinko board <laughs> yeah but there's there's I mean, there's many of these things where they're innate to our biology like we get a kick out of it and we don't like really know why it's not a logical thing and he goes into a lot of that when he talks about sort of how to you know both sell a company and how to build identity at a company or at any type of organization or family or what have you um, and you know I'm only about halfway through it so I still have quite a bit to read but uh, I was v I'm very impressed and definitely if you don't want to read the book at least check Wait, out so you don't know the ending yet TED you talks. can't recommend it without knowing the ending <laughs> He has two TED Talks, and they're both great. Um, so, you know, the, the TED Talks take a total of, what, maybe 40 minutes, and the book would take, you know, you know, a few hours. So watch the TED Talks. If you like them, read the book. I've done both, well, half of, half of one and, and all of the other, and I'm a big fan. All right. My book of the week is a science fiction book, Childhood and Childhood's End, Arthur C. Clarke. Classic okay. science fiction book. Next. Is it a classic in the sense? Like, yes. is it from the 50s? Uh, I don't know exactly okay. when it was from. But it's definitely retro because the the technology, the futuristic technology is really, like, uh, not chuckle-worthy, but just kind of like, like, oh, interesting. That's right. They didn't have, <laughs> like, computer screens. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Or stuff like that, right? Like, oh, you would use a, you know, it's like if someone said using the telegraph to talk to a satellite. It's like, What? yeah um no it, yeah so yeah it's it's amazing watching like watching or reading like science fiction material that's old because uh like there's one of them i read I think it was maybe uh, okay like in snow crash they uh which you know snow crash isn't that old neil stevenson but it uh it um they they describe this thing that is basically second life but, uh, you know, just at the time, it's just so crazy and outlandish because it's pre-internet. You know? So, yeah, I don't talk a lot about the book because I never know what to say without spoiling a fiction book. But uh, it's interesting. It's intriguing. It's kind of weird, but like weird in a way that makes you think. So you should check it out if you've never okay. read it before. Yeah, definitely. All right. So now on tool to, of the show. This is tool of the show. show. My tool of the show is Uber. I used Uber for the first time. For people who don't know what it is, it is a phone uh, app uh, where you uh, make an account you associate it with your credit card or some kind of payment system I think they're accepting like PayPal and things like that now and then uh, <clears throat> and then it uh, is a taxi service and it's actually pretty amazing so I'll, I'll tell you my experience quickly my car broke and my wife uh, 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 we towed the car to, to a dealership or no wait sorry my car broke but it didn't it, we, we also had to tow it to the dealership a month ago but the last time it broke we a uh, different car we drove it to the dealership uh, dropped it off and then my wife drove me to work um they had it fixed uh you know at the end of the day and so i had to get back to the car dealership by myself so i took uber so first things first you go into the program it uh you know because of your phone's gps and other location and services it knows where you are uses that information and it gives you a little map and uh basically says here's where i think you are do you want to be picked up here um, then it shows you what kind of car, uh, it gives you a list of car choices and you can put in if you need a baby seat and things like that. I just need a regular Uber, right? So then it says, okay, cool. Um, where do you want to go? You put in your, you find your destination on the map, which works just like, I think it uses Google maps, but it's just, it's very intuitive, right? Tap on your destination. Um, you can also search for it and then, um, it'll give you an estimate of the price, which in my case ended up being right on they gave me a range and ended up being right in the middle <clears throat> and uh, 
um, and then it tells you it will tell you how long before the driver gets there and, and so on and so forth then well, as soon as you accept it shows you the driver before he's even gotten to you on the map so you can sit there on your phone and like sort of like passively watch this little pac-man game being played out where you, where the driver like makes his way over to where you are um, it also shows you a picture of the driver so you know it's like an uber the guy picking you up and not some like psycho killer unless the psycho killer has a mask um, then the uh, guy picks you up, takes you to the uh, wherever your destination is, and you just walk out. Like the payment's already done. You don't have to deal with tip. You don't have that awkwardness. You don't have to fumble around in your wallet for like dollar bills or anything. You just walk out. Um, I thought the whole thing was awesome and uh, highly recommend it. Nice. My tool of the show are store coupon apps. Save money. Don't be embarrassed. Don't have to worry about printing out before you leave. Just look it up while you're standing in line waiting. Done. Store coupon apps. Yeah, download like, apps like, for the example. store you shop at on your phone and get the coupons. Like, what's an example? So if you go to Target, Target has an app. You just download the Target app, and they got coupons. Or Home Depot. I was at Home Depot. Oh. And I was standing in line saying, huh, I wonder if there's a coupon. I downloaded the Home Depot app. It's like, sure enough, here's a coupon. I just click it, and the person scans it, and I save money. Holy cow! I did not know. So that. I spend. I, I find that stores here can get very busy, especially if you go right after work, because everybody else has the same idea. And so stand in line. And while I'm standing in line, I just cruise for coupons. I d- I did not know that the. So I've never installed a store. I just app, saved you money. I did not know that they had coupons. Oh my like gosh! Every check, you should that check like amazing. every store you go to. Yeah, I, I I should I should just have a. Page on my or like phone, right when you get to the store, you're like in the parking lot. Like just pull it up in advance and be like, "Here's the things I need." Like I wonder if there's anything. Oh yeah, look there. Oh man, that is amazing. Wow. Okay. Cool. That was very generic, so non-specific, but no, I'm I glad mean, this has a, uh, well, such an impact on uh, you. I I uh, I will definitely do that. I will definitely get the Target app and the Whole Foods. Yeah. App so like the, uh, the grocery store, Safeway has one too, and different ones have like. You know, sometimes they like you know have like a not like a rewards program per se, but kind of where like they, they when you scan it, they know what you you can have like various coupons collapse into kind of one scan, and you just scan it, and all the coupons that apply, it just takes them off, and then it recommends new oh, ones cool. for you that are related, right? So that's their way to get you back to the store. But yeah, they tend to be pretty helpful, and it's a store I already go to typically, so I don't really mind. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'll definitely so, check yep, that check out. Check it out. So now we're on to cool. Haskell. So Haskell, Haskell is a functional programming language. So Jason, yeah, tell real us, quick, oh, oh, sorry no, to interject, oh, but before oh, we before up. we before we dive into Haskell, I just want to give a, a, a shout a, a out a explanation. Oh, explanation. No, shout out. Sorry. The uh, I know we said we'd do Swift. Okay. We'll definitely do Swift. But we got several requests over the week. We got a ton of requests actually over the week to do Haskell like every a lot. Week. Yeah, well, everywhere. Yeah, but especially this week, we got blasted to do Haskell. And ironically, we got requests to do Swift after we had decided we were going to abandon Swift for Haskell this week. So it's sort of like, I don't know if people are messing with us. Yes. But uh, but anyways, so that's why we're doing Brace Haskell. Brace yourselves. Swift. Swift is coming. Swift is coming swiftly. <laughs> uh, yes. You completely botched my train. I had like an awesome transition to it. It was, it was <laughs> Sorry. epic. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh so Haskell is a, func- Haskell. a functional programming language. So Jason, why don't you start us off by telling us something about functions in Haskell? Okay. So one thing about Haskell is functions, they're uh, first-class citizens. And uh, a lot of people don't know what first-class citizens, what that really means. Like, it's a term that you hear, but nobody ever really defines it, at least not to me. And Which probably so, means uh, they have wrong definitions. Sort of like yeah, yeah. So, so when that happens, you usually figure like, oh, it means that like I have a like this vague, nebulous idea of what that means. But all that means there's there's just a handful of things that you need to to be a first class citizen in a programming language. Um, one is being able to be passed as a parameter. So in other words, like a function should be able to take this thing as an argument. Um, it should be able to be returned from a function, which is you know very similar, and it should be able to be assigned to a variable. So if 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 th- the particular construct you're talking about can can do those three things, it's a first class citizen. So that's why, for example, in Java, um, classes, the actual class definition is a first class citizen because you can actually pass 
the class type as a function parameter to some function that like needs that for, for something very specific, right? But in C++, for example, um, classes are not first first class citizens. I mean, classes are, but class definitions class are not first class citizens. That's right. But a class definition, like the names of the methods and things like that, are removed by the compiler. And so uh, it, it cannot be a first class citizen. So, yep, in Haskell, functions are first class citizens, which allows you to build interesting things, right? So one thing where I've used uh, functions as first class citizens before um, is, or, or just even, you know, kind of using functions in an interesting way, is several times I've implemented kind of like a state machine. And, you know, a state machine, kind of naively, people tend to, you know, kind of like the first way you ever implement it, and sometimes it's the right way, is you just have like an enumeration, and the enumeration has all your states. And then the thing that gets called each update or whatever um, gets passed in what the current conditions are and whether you should transition a state is just a big switch case statement, right? So you switch on the state and you have various cases to handle moving from one to the other. Um, and it gets really messy, right? Another way to do it is to right. have separate files or classes to represent each of the states. And then you essentially hold a, a pointer, a variable that you know points to the class as the function that should be called. So, hey, here's the update that should be called. This is maybe not a completely great example of like all that effort being a first class citizen entails. But if you think about you know pointing to the function itself, and then you may pass in, hey, here's the function, like a callback function. I want you to call when you're done changing your state or whatever. Um, and that's how you kind of link the, link the series of events to handle the state machine without having to have like a giant switch case statement. And it allows you to dynamically change the behavior so you can reconfigure what state transitions to which else based on something different. And it allows you to build up something really complex without having like really nasty spaghetti code. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, another thing about Haskell, it's, uh, it's pure. So uh, what that means is uh, each function is will do exactly the same thing given the same set of parameters. So there's no like global memory that you can mess with or um, or anything or anything like that. Like if you call a function with X Y Z, it will return A B C every single time. Where yeah yeah yep. That was confusing because at first I thought you um, meant variable named <laughs> X Y Z. Oh no! Yeah. So yeah, if you call a function with a certain uh, set of inputs, you will get exactly the same output every yeah. time. Well, provided that it's not based on time or something like that. But there's definitely there's no other uh, you know variables that can affect your. Function. So even the notion, and I find this a little difficult, and I, I'm not even barely scratching the surface of functional programming. I still have a lot, a lot to go, and I'm always trying to learn a little bit more because I think it's helpful in reasoning about other stuff, but is that even the variable name can be confusing in a pure language because it's not really variable. If you say x is equal to 5, um, x always needs to be equal to 5 or else you're a liar. Um, and so you can't change what x is equal to later on. If you say it, said it's 5, it needs to always be 5. Um, and so... Oh, so you're saying why call it a variable? Yeah, so it's not variable. Variable means it varies. <laughs> Yeah, but it can't vary. <laughs> so people say the variable x is equal, but it's well, it's not a variable. It can't vary. Um, uh, well, what if x is equal to a function that was based on input from a file or something? I, maybe if, if x is equal to a function, then it could vary, right? But if you say x is equal to the function addition, it needs to always be equal to the addition function. Even if it does different addition, it still has to do addition. Oh, you're right. That makes yeah, sense. but one of yeah. the one so it does turn it up on its so the alternative functional programming is typically called imperative programming. Um, you know things execute line one, then line two, then line three, um, and so one of the things that turns it on its head is the fact that you have to think about things differently when you can't just change the state willy nilly, as we'll say, um, and when things don't just go around changing what other things are. Um, you have to kind of think about it differently if you first learned imperative, and there seems to be a debate about. Which one's easier to learn first? Like, if you is it hard to learn functional programming, or is it just because we mostly learn non-functional languages and then try to learn functional later? Um, yeah, I read this interesting article that talked about functional languages uh, as uh, using uh, Excel spreadsheets as an example. What? 
Yeah, if you look at an Excel spreadsheet, like Excel is a functional language. Because if you look at an Excel spreadsheet, each of the cells contains a function of the other cells, but there's no um, order. So it's uh. not imperative, right? So you're not saying, you know, compute this cell and then compute that cell. You're just saying this cell is based on these other cells, and then you're relying on Excel to to realize the value of the cells in an order that makes sense. And like I think I wonder what happens if you create a loop in Excel. It probably just Oh, it just yeah, it just, just everything that's in, it can't it can't evaluate. It puts like a special flag and basically says something's wrong. <laughs> like does not yeah, compute. You could say like A1 equals B1 plus C1 and B1 equals A1 plus C1 or something and then it's just like the whole world falls apart. Or or just A equals B and B equals A. If you just put that in, you get all errors, I guess. But at, at any rate, so so Excel is a perfect example of a functional language that everybody has used. Well, um, maybe not everybody, so but you don't think? I mean, like again, this this is like debatable. Right. But what do you constitute as everybody? I would consider. I mean, because think about it. I'm sure our parents use Excel. No, I I was just, I, okay. Yeah, you have a fair point. I I was just <laughs> being pedantic. I think, no, but I mean, it's interesting. I wonder what percentage of, say, Americans or, or let's say, Westerners. We'll say people listening uh, to this podcast Excel. probably have a pretty high chance of using some short of. Oh, yeah. People listening to this podcast is probably close to 100%. But yes. But anyways, so the uh, so so if you think about Excel and how it works, that is sort of a good introduction to a functional language because you just put a bunch of functions all over the place and then you just let Excel take care of everything. And one of the happy benefits or one of the reasons why you would want to have this pureness where so getting uh, the where things don't change, right? You can say that if X is equal to five, it's always equal to five. If I pass in some value, there's no side effect. So if I have the function addition and I pass in one and two, I will always get three. Is it allows you to do things that you can't always do without a very large set of restrictions in another language, which are kind of reasoning about a program. So if I validate that one plus one equal, always equals two in Haskell, uh, or one plus one equals two once, right? Like I don't need to keep checking it with varying other states of the program because it's just not a thing. So you can say something about the correctness of a function and the compiler can reason about what stuff will be and what's safe to change or not change versus if you're referencing a global variable, for instance, it has to believe that global variable could change at any time. And so it can't reason about the interaction of that global variable to the rest of uh, the function that, that may have nothing to do with that global variable you know, directly. That's right. So you can actually, in Haskell, you don't have to define the type of most of the variables, maybe even all of the variables. I think there's actually some very specific cases which you'll almost never run into in practice where you have to specify the type. Um, but in general, you don't have to specify the type for anything because Haskell can evaluate the code and figure out what type it should and be. And that's a good transition and into uh, one of the strengths of Haskell, which is this type system. Yeah, I mean, most of these, you know, if you think about Lisp or Prolog or other functional languages, they're all weakly typed. And in general, weakly typed languages like Lisp and Python, it's just very hard to scale those, right? Because what will happen is you'll end up with compile time errors that you won't catch until runtime. And whenever you have that situation, you're inherently less productive, right? Because you have to actually deploy something or run some kind of very uh, in-depth like simulation to find an error that, you know, a, a language with a stronger compiler would tell you immediately, right? So, so one of the beauties about Haskell is it's a functional language, but it has the strength, a strong type system that will let you, um, that will catch a lot of these errors and let you be more productive. Yeah, and so the the type system allows static typing, so that when you compile your program, the compiler can reason about the type of an object and do type checking for you, so you can catch a lot of errors at compile time. Um, the you'll hear this fancy term. So there's a lot of research around Haskell. It seems to be like kind of like a running joke that. Uh, you know, Haskell is only used by researchers. Um, I, I, don't, I can't. Yeah, like programming language compiler yeah. writers. <laughs> so um, one of the things you hear this Hindley Milner type inference, and you can go read about like what that is in very, very specifics. 
but um, it kind of gives you two things. One is it basically is a way, a method for defining what types a given expression can have, and then an uh, algorithm for computing the type of an exp a given expression. Um, and so these things together are really powerful. And you, you hear about, like I hear about this a lot, that you know, oh, the type system in Haskell is really strong and really powerful. And without you know really getting into it, it's, it's hard to know what that means. But essentially, it's a way of, of allowing you to write functions and do function overloading. Um, so like in C++, you would have to do templated programming um, to kind of handle generic types. So Haskell allows you kind of ways of saying, I have an item A and is an input to this function, and the output is a list of type A's, um, you know, a set of type, uh, uh, you know, more than one of type right. A's together, and allows you to do stuff like that and do checking, um, which is something you can do in other languages, but it just happens to be the specific way that it's implemented, and you're able to define stuff in Haskell that you can do very interesting things. Uh, and just, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, that just like in C++, you can get into a lot of problems with templated programming. You can get into some really deep weeds with uh, playing with the type system and doing really complex things in the type system in Haskell. Uh, Haskell can be sometimes hard to read for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, or even sometimes are, but uh, the type system especially <laughs> so seems just like a lot of it I look at and just like, oh, I don't even know what this is saying. So it's something to be careful yeah, about. I, uh, I looked at, you know, a couple of people on the, my team at the last place I worked wrote a bunch of Haskell and sadly we ended up throwing it away because nobody else knew Haskell and we ended up having to just rewrite it all, which is, which is actually pretty sad because it kind of hurt their feelings. Anyways, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was one of the big things was that it was just very hard to understand what the program was doing. But I think that, you know, it, it's, it was also very hard to use Unix, but now everyone's using Unix. Like Windows has a bunch of Unix in it. OS X is built on BSD, right? So, so uh, you know, it might be that Haskell is just before its time. Like, isn't that the phrase? Maybe, yeah. But I, I think some of it also is people... So this is the same problem. I, so this is my issue with Perl. Is I have no problem with Perl specifically. Like you know, I don't, I don't have strong feelings either way. But a lot of times people try to do crazy stuff in Perl to kind of show off. So like, oh, I can do this in one line in Perl. Right? And you get the classic Perl one-liners. But they're impossible <laughs> yeah, to right. understand. Like that's great if you're doing something once, one time. Like you're trying to clean up some input text, and no one will ever try to do it again. Uh, you're just going to store that result somewhere and everybody else will use the cleaned result? Like, sure, great, fine, show off. Um, but if you're going to, like, be submitting code that's going to be maintained, like, it's better to be a little bit more verbose and write it out. And, you know, some people argue back, so this is a constant debate I was having recently on my team, is that some people say, oh, no, it's better to do these, I call them clever things. Uh, people a lot of times do it to try to show off, like, using things which aren't always commonly used and it's not always immediately obvious what they're doing because it reduces line of code count. Um, and they, the reason they say is because every line of code is a potential bug. So the less lines of code you write, the less bugs you might you will have. Uh, I guess that, I, I don't know, like maybe. Well, but, yeah, I, I think you have to think about bug density, so, right? Yeah, <laughs> so that's the problem is like, I can't reason about your code quickly. If you wrote it out more verbosely and I can reason about it quickly, I'm more likely to help you catch errors. I'm more likely to either reject or gloss over um, if you write some line of code that I'm not exactly sure what it's doing. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to say yeah, that no, I definitely. reject it, but reality is sometimes you're pressed for time and you've got a lot of stuff to go through. And so sometimes you let something slip through and it's like, if you had known what they were trying to do, you wouldn't have let it. Like you would have realized it was a problem. Yeah, yeah, but definitely. That's, so this is not no, a conversation I, on this call. This is a, a little bit on. of a sidetrack. Yeah, no, but but to your point though, I think functional languages in general require a lot more documentation. Yeah, you know, because they make the claim like that they're much less verbose than they are. But I think the you know, whereas in Java maybe you know a comment per uh, file is okay. In Haskell, where a f you know like a hundred lines could actually be doing quite a lot, you should definitely be very verbose in your commenting. So I kind of have, so, and, and this is always like something that's a little hard to pin down, but um, people try to explain concepts and sometimes try to show off by how like uh, detailed or complicated the process is. But I actually think 
that's kind of like I, I don't personally care for that style. I prefer that if you could explain it to me shortly and in a way that like my grandma could understand it, right? Like then you've done a better job than a person who can use more buzzwords. Um, and so, right. and I think sometimes that, you know, as an industry, yeah, there might be uses for Haskell, but sometimes you get people who are just fanatic about it and they like the fact that it's very exclusive and that, you know, it, you know, they can go through kind of the pain of doing it, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it is, it is really a good tool for the job. And like I said, one of the benefits I've gotten from learning functional, trying to learn functional programming more and more, um, I won't say I've learned it is, uh, is a new way of thinking <laughs> okay. about things. And sometimes like we were talking about, you know, the way of doing different state machines. Sometimes you don't implement it in a functional programming language, but you take some concept with you. Um, that's really helpful. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you can get a lot of functional ideas into other languages. Like, like with Java, you could have classes where the class implements some interface. The interface only has one function in it. And now you basically have function pointers in Java. So you, one thing to take away is that every language you learn sort of helps you holistically become a better programmer. Yep, 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 yep. Um, so cool. So, can you explain what a monad is? Otherwise, you aren't a true Haskell. No, well, I'm not a true Haskell. <laughs> I failed that test. Um, so, uh, I think it's hard to explain what monads are because it's, it's a complicated concept. Um, but I will try one way that I've begun to think about it. And I'm by no means no. I won't even say I'm. I'm not even a monad beginner. Um, and so, so there's probably people who could give us a better explanation. If you have a great explanation that you can send us that short, send it to us and we'll read it on air and give you credit. <laughs> <clears throat> and if my grandma, if I can read it to my grandma and she understands it, uh, you will probably win some sort of Nobel Prize. I'm not sure in what, but um, <laughs> so if you think about a function, right? Like a function is some way of doing computation, a, a notion, a, a notation for for how to to find like this thing is going to take some input, produce some output, and here's what it will do. And in Haskell, you can't have any side effects uh, in your traditional functions. So if you think about a function being um, very strict in scope, and you think about something that's more general than a function, uh, that can have notation that says other things besides I have an input, some code you're going to execute, and an output, um, and here's maybe the types. But like you want to be able to have kind of almost other uh, tags or syntactic sugar or things that you want to be able to say more about a function than just those things. Like uh, you may want to say this thing does input or output. This has, this could raise an exception um, that it sometimes doesn't produce any result at all. If you want to say things at a higher level than just take some input, do some computation, produce some output. And, and, and reason at a higher level about what the function is going to do. That's kind of what monads are are able to do for you. Oh, okay. I th this probably I, I think that's that's how I'm currently understanding it. So the classic one in, in Haskell is is for input and output. So if you want to write to the screen, you can't do that in a normal in a, in a normal function. So you have a monad which allows you to say, hey, I have some code that's going to run, but I'm also going to do other stuff. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna have input and output. I'm going to write to the screen. Um, I might pause, um, things like that. And so that oh. informs the compiler, you know, that like, hey, something different than the rest of the program is going to happen here. Uh, and things that interact with it, it knows how to kind of think about those. Oh, I see what you're saying. So it's a, it's a, it's a way yeah, of... Yeah, I still got to wrap yeah, my head around it. And it. I haven't fully either. And I think there's many things it can be used for. Um, but, it, you know, it's kind of a way of calling out that here is something that is going to have a side effect without just making the whole program basically say might have side effects. So you're saying here's oh, things which can produce side effects, but the other things don't, right? Like, so. Yeah. Gotcha. Anyways, that's probably a poor explanation, but I tried. <laughs> okay. No, I, I, I think it makes sense. I mean, it's one of these things where I, I think I have to like, have it explained to me many times and then each time i'll pick a little, up a little facet bit more. of the yeah i'm in the same boat and i'm still beginning my journey of understanding it so lazy evaluation oh, cool. so yeah another thing haskell has is lazy evaluation and so again just think about say the excel example right let's say there's some cells that are way off the table like like your screen is like you're looking at cells a to g and rows one to ten or one to 30 
on your screen. But if you were to scroll way down to, you know, row 15 million, there would be some data there, right? But if it, obviously, you know, if, if you tell Excel, like, add columns A and B, it's not going to add the infinite number of rows of A and B together, right? Like, it's going to probably just add what you have on your screen and maybe, like, some of the border. And as you scroll around, Excel will will start filling in cells that it didn't know before, yeah. right? Like, it still knows how to compute them, but it's not going to compute them because you're not looking at them. Yep, right? and it knows how, it may so, have to compute some of them because you may have a cell on your screen that references some of them. And so it'll go compute those, but the ones that you don't care about, have no reference to right now, it won't do. Exactly, exactly. There's gotta be some way to really screw with Excel. Like to, I'm sure people have done this, like crazy Excel hacks um. where it just locks <laughs> your computer. Like you open a spreadsheet and your whole computer locks up or something. Anyway, so, uh, so this is lazy evaluation. Haskell uh, does this as yep. well. So if um, you know they might define uh, you know a function or a set of functions over a space, um, but they're not going to instantiate every possible one of them. Um, they're going to at runtime start realizing the values of of uh, the outputs of functions as you. Which need leads them. you to weird things like infinite lists, which okay, and church encodings, which I tried to understand and I still don't understand. <laughs> I've never heard of Okay, all right. That There's lot, this is the story of my Haskell life, like researching one thing after another. But it, like I said, you learn. <laughs> so we have some resources for getting started uh, real quick. Learn you a Haskell for great good. This is a very interesting approach to a programming language book. Uh, and it's you can either buy the Dead Tree version or uh, read it online. Um, and it, it's pretty good. I, I didn't make it all the way through. I kind of... It's one of those things like Haskell's uh, complexity curve is very exponential. So you read early and it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's too slow, too slow, too slow. So you just kind of start skipping and you're like, oh, wow, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> not like linear. So um, there's also learn Haskell fast and hard, um, which has an interactive component to it, which I was playing with earlier today in preparation. So I think I'm gonna have to check that out a little more too. Oh, cool. Very cool. So. Um, yeah, this is awesome. So definitely check it out, Haskell. It's getting a lot of popularity, and it, it's very forward-thinking. It's uh, right now, like, programming language geeks like it, but, you know, as you said, you know, Unix geeks were the only people who liked Unix, and now everyone's running it in some form or another. So, um, yeah, it was great uh, doing the show on Haskell. It's been long overdue, and uh, we look forward to uh, doing some Swift next All time. All right, till next time. All right, see you later. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.